Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Yi Chao Ray. I'm a research scientist at Rodal Institute, where I also serve as the research director of the farming systems trial, which we're going to talk about today. But before we get started, here are just some housekeeping rules for today's webinar. First of all, during the presentation, I cannot hear you, but I hope everyone can hear me clearly. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A function to send them through, and I will respond to each of them at the end of the, my presentation. And if you experience any other difficulties, please reach out to Maria Pop, our Director of Education on this number on the screen. And as usual, this webinar will be recorded and shared on our website and our YouTube channel. So let's get started. I'm sure that most of you on this meeting would know Rodal Institute very well. Sometimes when I talk to some people in the public, they would tell me that they still have Rodal books and magazines from the 1950s and 60s sitting in their basement. That's right. It was actually those Rodal books and magazines that helped popularize the term organic in the United States. So Rodal Institute was founded by our founder J.I. Rodell in 1947. We've been around for over 70 years and it is widely recognized as the birthplace of organic agriculture in the United States. Our headquarter is located in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. It's about two hours from New York City and one hour from Philadelphia. In the recent years, we have significantly expanded to other geographical locations in this country and in the world, around the world. Our European Organic Center just opened in the beginning of 2022. But today we will be talking about the farming systems trial, the flagship research program of Rhoda Institute. So the farming systems trial was established in 1981. So it's still up and running, uh, existing as the longest running side-by-side -side comparison of organic and conventional grain production systems in North America. So it's been around for over 40 years. So speaking of history, 40 years ago was a time that the conventional industrial chemical agriculture became mainstream in the United States and many parts of the world. It was a time that a lot of scientific and technological breakthroughs happening in the agriculture sector. Also, a lot of the uh, practices that now we consider unsustainable that became widely adopted in agriculture. For example, the massive use of chemicals and large operations of monocropping. So, these practices helped, helped increase the efficiency of our farmland. For example, corn yields in the last 50, 50 years has doubled more than, uh, more than doubled in the last 50 years. So the efficiency of our agriculture production really increased, was increased by these practices. But in the meantime, we also saw a wide, degradation of our soils and other resources. So that's another outcome of the industrial and chemical agriculture in the last 50 years. And it's not just about soil degradation because, because unsustainable practices were just putting a motion, a motion in downward spiral of soil degradation, started from soil, we will also see depletion of soil nutrients, soil fertility, and decline in soil structure, 
loss of soil resilience and the climate change, declining ecosystem services and loss of biodiversity. So these are all the effects that are caused by the degradation in the soil. And these degradation will also in return affect and trigger other social degradation, for example, hunger, malnutrition, and political unrest. So the, the degradation in soil is just not just about soil, it's about many aspects of our civilization. So how can we change that? How can we keep our agriculture efficient, but try to mitigate or reverse these degradations? Are there any, any other approaches? So in, in the same time, in the mid 20th century, there were also another alternative approach has been proposed that's an organic solution to farming, to agriculture. So organic pioneers, including Sir Albert Howard, Rudolf Steiner, and Lady Balfour in, the, in, the, in Europe, and J.I. Rodell and Rachel Carson in the United States, proposed another way of farming that's ecologically based and that's, that can be also be efficient. So in 1970s and 1970s, there was, also, there was also a lot of discussions in the United States, how can we utilize this approach? For example, there are reports and recommendations that came up with by, or, uh, by USDA to propose these principles to organic farming. For example, to eliminate chemicals, diversify crop rotations, maximize living cover through so cover cropping and perennialization and use natural fertilizers such as compost and green manure. So these approaches are ecologically based. So they tend to use the biological fertility uh, instead of the, the synthetic fertility to maintain and support productive agriculture. But also that was a time that people were questioning had questions about the effectiveness of this such approach. For example, first of all, does it work? Is it is organic just for backyard gardening or can it be applied to a large scale, thousands of acres and still be profitable and manageable? Does it work? And also if it works, why? Why does it work? What's the mechanism? This is especially uh, interesting to agriculture researchers. So to answer these questions, the farming systems trial was started by Bob Rodell, the then president of Rodell Institute and the Rodell Press, and Dr. Richard Harwood, our uh, internationally renowned agricultural scientist in 1981. So today it's still up and running. And just very briefly, the farming system trial started with three major agriculture systems. One conventional system that's mimicking the majority of the conventional corn and soybean systems in the United States. And two organic systems, one organic legume system and one organic manure system. So the legume and manure based organic systems are managed under different principles because there are some organic farmers, they don't have access to the uh, uh, organic amendments such as manure or compost. So they have to re uh, rely on leguminous input as source of fertility. So these different systems, conventional and organic, they differ in their cash crops, cover crops and input. For example, the conventional system has a very simple corn and soybean rotation. That's because it's what the conventional farmers are mostly growing. Corn and soybean are grown in about 50% of the croplands in the United States. So uh, in our current uh, system, these are the, the most uh, common commodity crops in our conventional market. And in the beginning, the conventional system did not have any, any cover crops. And this inputs are mainly synthetic. 
synthetic, uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. The organic legume system has a four-year rotation, corn, oats, soybean, and, and wheat. So every year after the harvest of the cash crops, there are cover crops planted in the wintertime covering the field, covering the fields, protecting the soil, and fix carbon and nitrogen from the air. Apart from these cover crops, which can replenish carbon and nitrogen in the soil, there's no additional input into the system. So the legume-based organic system is a low input or zero input system. So it would be interesting to see whether such system could still produce uh, corn, soybean, and other, other grains after 40 years. And the organic manure system features a much longer nine-year rotation. So on top of the four-year corn, oats, soybean, wheat rotation, we also have three years hay, consisting of orchard grass and alfalfa, and corn silage and wheat. So apart from the cover crops, we also have periodic application of composted manure into the system to replenish the, uh, the fertility. So in the four, in the, over the 40 years, we have been uh, monitoring uh, different areas of research, for example, crop yields, soil health, environmental quality, and economics of these different systems. And all, I have to mention that all these systems were managed with full tillage. So that means primary tillage every year in the fall. So these for tillage have been managed in all these systems until 2008, uh, when we made some modification to some of these of the plots of the systems, which I'll mention in a minute. And we found that the yield of organic systems could largely match or outperform the conventional systems. And we thought that was because that organic systems had had seen the increase the soil organic matter and intrinsic soil fertility over time from 1981 to 2008. So as you can see in the, in the graph on the right-hand side, the two organic systems are reflected by the orange and the green lines and the conventional system was reflected by the blue line. So the soil organic matter level in organic system increased gradually from 1981 while the soil organic matter in the conventional system stay largely unchanged. So the soil organic matter level and soil biology, soil fertility increased in organic matter, in an organic system. We thought that was the main reason that supported the productivity of the organic systems relative to the con uh, conventional system. And moreover, we found that in years of extreme drought, in dry years, we found organic system can produce about 30% more yields than the conventional system, reflecting higher resiliency against climate change. So that's very important because we know that in the future, in the coming decades, there will be more of these extreme years. So we have to be prepared. Right? So, Go back, let's go back to the questions that was asked in the beginning. So does organic work? Yes, I think the answer, yes, it works with proper fertility management. And why it works and what's the mechanism? So the mechanism why the organic system would work and perform similarly or even better than the conventional system can be uh, answered by this comparison here. So we can see that on the left-hand side, the conventional system, it's largely supported by the synthetic fertility, which di directly provides inorganic nutrient to crops. But it does not help the soil microbes to become abundant and diverse. As a result, the roots, root systems of the conventional system are very shallow and the microbial abundance is lower than the organic system. Whereas in the organic system, we can see the fertility comes from 
and leguminous cover crops and or uh, organic input because of higher microbial diversity and abundance the recycling of these nutrients are much more efficient so even there's no there's much lower inorganic nitrogen content the organic source of nitrogen and other nutrients can be efficiently recycled to support the organic production aided by efficient plant and microbe interactions. So that's the mechanism underpinning the uh, productivity of organic systems. Okay, so that's uh, basically what we found, the key messages, what we found in the first 30 years of this trial. And that has been reported by previous reports. For example, the farming systems trial 30 years report. But in the recent years, a lot of things happened. A lot of things happened in the world and also happened in the agricultural sector, right? For example, management practices are always evolving. So there has been recent development in agriculture, for example, in the conventional system in the last few decades. There has been a major shift towards more reduced till or no till. So in such systems, because of use of chemicals, pesticides such as Roundup, which can, can, can help with the burn down, uh, burn down of, of the crop or crops and the weeds. So completely no-till is made possible by using chemicals. And that's actually very a very important issue of organic system because organic systems have always been criticized for using too much tillage because organic systems cannot use uh, synthetic input to, to kill weeds. There has to be other methods to, uh, to manage the weeds. For example, organic system, organic corn soybean system always rely on cultivation to manage the weeds in a season. Cultivation, especially multiple passes of cultivation in a, uh, in a growing season means multiple times of soil disturbance and tillage practices. So this has to be addressed in the future of organic system. Luckily, we have, we have seen efforts in the last two decades trying to develop organic no-till systems or organic reduced till system, such as the cover crop based reduced to system. So in such systems, cover crops are planted in the fall, like organic farmers always do, right? But in the next spring, different from traditional ways to, to terminate the cover crop use, using a plow, the organic, the organic no-till system would terminate the cover crops mechanically by using uh, specific tools such as the roller crimper shown in a picture in the middle. So the roller crimper would roll down the cover crops to form a mulch that can suppress weeds in a growing season. Because of that, the need to cultivate uh, between the rows is eliminated. So in the year of 2008, we made important modifications of the farming system trial. All three systems, including the, or including the conventional system and the two organic systems were divided into full till and reduced till, or you can say till or no till. So in a conventional system, the full till uh, plus remained as the same what happened in the last in the previous 30 years primary primary tillage was still used to prepare the seed bed and reduced to in a reduced to plots glyphosate and gmo seeds have been used to achieve completely no till in the two organic systems the in the full till organic systems a mobile plow is used to terminate cover crops and prepare the seed bed by disking and packing. And in a growing season, in a growing season, multiple paths of, of cultivation or conducted to manage weeds. 
And in the organic reduced till systems, we use the roller crimper, as I just mentioned, to terminate the cover crops. And the cover crop residues will form a mulch to suppress weeds in the growing season. So there's no zero pass of tillage, tillage, tillage in that year. But I have to mention that reduced tillage is achieved in different ways in conventional and organic systems. In conventional system, in the conventional system, reduced tillage is continuous no-till. It's completely no-till since 2008. And in organic systems, reduced tillage is rotational no-till. So what does that mean? So that means when there are years, rotation phases uh, of corn soybean, which are large grains, we use the roller crimper to terminate the cover crops. But in other phases of the crop rotation, we still use tillage to prepare the seed bed to establish cover crops and uh, small grains. So with that, we can see that the tillage reduction in organic and conventional systems is different. So here's uh, the scores of the soil tillage intensity rating, the STIR, calculated uh, by the total, uh, total amount of the tillage passes of the season. In, in such scoring system, the most aggressive tillage, for example, mobile plow would have a score of 65 and some uh, less aggressive tillage, for example, disking and packing would have a much lower score. So with that, we can see that in a conventional system, the RT or reduced till treatment almost completely eliminated tillage. Well, in the organic system, to organic systems, RT or reduced tillage, reduced tillage intensity by about 35% uh, on a rotation basis. So that's still a, a, a big step forward, right? Now we are, we are still not there yet to completely uh, do organic no-till, but it's at least a, a step forward. So now I'm gonna introduce the latest research findings that what we found in the last 12 years since we have divided all the systems, including organic and conventional into till and no-till or full tillage or reduced tillage. So first of all, crop yields, productivity, because these are the things that will matter at the end of the day, right? We want agriculture system to be productive. So we found that, for example, so these are the data from 2008 to 2020. So long-term average, 12 years average. First of all, corn yield. So we can see that the, the, we have six bars here, right? So the first two bars, the blue bars, are the conventional system. The green bar, two green bars are the organic legume system. And the two orange or yellow or the brown bars are the organic manure system. And the solid bars are representing, represent the full tillage systems. And the shaded bars represent the reduced till systems. So we can see that the manure, organic manure system can provide a similar amount of yield, current yield, compared to the conventional system, right? And that's a long-term, again, long-term average of 12 years data. So, but the organic legume system seemed to have slightly declined yield, current yield, compared to other systems. Again, the organic legume system is a low input or zero input system. Apart from the leguminous cover crops, this system does not receive any fertility input. So it's good that it's still producing corn soybean after 40 years without any input, right? Otherwise, we thought the soy fertility would be depleted after 40 years. Although even the yield is slightly lower than the conventional organic manure system, the organic legume system is still producing um, um, a decent amount of corn yield. And also looking at the difference between full tillage and a reduced tillage, we can see that across the board, reduced tillage result in a slight decrease in corn yield. So if you are not comparing organic 
and the full tillage and reduced tillage systems side by side, it may be difficult to, to comprehend that difference. But if you happen to have the opportunity to observe them side by side, this is what you will see. With the reduced tillage systems, because there are you know, a lot of residues on top of the soil, so the germination of the seeds can be made a little bit more challenging compared to the clear fields that have been plowed and the perfect seed bed that have been prepared on the full tillage. So that may have contributed to the difference between full tillage and reduced tillage. So that's corn yield. And next, we can look at the soybean yield. Soybean yield is a little different. We can see that the soybean yield was highest in the conventional system, but significantly lower in the two organic systems and not different between full tillage and reduced tillage system. So that may indicate the challenge of um, soybean in organic system. And because soybean is not as tall as corn and other crops, so it can be especially susceptible to weed pressure. And in Northeast area, this, the, the weed pressure sometimes can be uh, overwhelming for soybean. So in the last 40 years, we did observe a uh, lower yield in soybean than uh, in the organic system than the conventional system. And oats yield. Oats are only in the organic system, not in the conventional system. So we found that organic manure system um, had higher oat, uh, yield than the uh, organic legume system. And wheat yield. Wheat happened to be in the conventional system for a few years. So we found that the organic system can match the yield of the conventional system. So there's no statistical difference between the two systems, the three systems. Although we did see a slight decline on the reduced tillage in the conventional and the manure system. So the take home message here is that in general, except the soybean, we found the organic manure system has the, uh, the or equal or larger or higher yields than the conventional, which had equal or higher yield than organic legume system. So that means with proper fertility management, the organic manure system can provide productive uh, crop, crop pr production compared to conventional management. Also reduced tillage slightly lowered crop yields over the for 12 years. Okay, here's a, 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 a data. Uh, here's the, some data from the yield, current yield of 2016, an extremely dry year. So I just showed you the long-term average data of 12 years. Here's the data of one year that had very little rainfall nine inches of rainfall from June 1st to August 31st in 2016. So we found that in that year, the bo both organic systems were more productive than the conventional system. Even the organic legume system were more productive than the conventional system. That may indicate soil health. Resilience was important, was an important feature of organic system. Well, conventional system, although in when everything is right, the environmental conditions are favorable, they can be productive. But when extreme weather conditions hit, the conventional systems can be hit hard. And again, reduced tillage, slightly lower yields across the board. And based on these crop yield data and the cost data, we came up with a 12 year economic analysis based on the data of 2008 to 20, 2020. We first broken down the costs into different categories, including land costs, land costs, which were the same for these different systems, field operations, labor, and total cost. So this is a uh, approach to to, to model the economic input, input costs and revenues uh, for a 110 acre farm, which is the average size of the farm in the United States. 
So we can see that, for example, in different category of the costs, reduced tillage led to lower costs. For example, 4.5% lower cost in the conventional system, 6% lower cost in the legume system under reduced tillage, because there's reduced most uh, most associated with uh, reduced cost of labor and reduced field operations. But the costs are highest in a conventional system, largely attributed to by the pest management, which are essentially the pesticides, herbicides, and fertility, synthetic fertilizers. So these have contrib contributed to the highest cost in the conventional system. And with that, we can also look at the gross revenues of the organic uh, of the of the different systems. So here are the total revenues of these systems with organic price premiums or without organic price premiums. Let's first take a look at the graph on the left hand side. So that indicates the revenues of the systems with organic price premium. So that means the organic products have higher prices than the conventional product. So we can see we can see that both organic legume and organic manure system had higher revenues than the conventional system, right? And on the right-hand side, we can see that without organic price premiums, the organic legume system seems to have lower gross uh, revenues compared to the other two, conventional and uh, organic manure system. However, organic manure system still can uh, match the gra gross revenue of the conventional system. So that's again, taking into account of all the crops, corn, soybean, and all other crops in the rotation. It's based on rotation. And with that, we can calculate the net returns. We found that again, on the left-hand side, the net returns of all these systems with organic price premium, we can see that both organic legume system and organic manure system are much more profitable than the conventional system. So that means when organic pr produce have higher pr prices of the organic price premiums, they can really make a difference for the farmers profit profitability. However, on the right hand side, if we take away the organic, organic price premium, we can see that the organic legume system are not profitable anymore because of the lower yields of the system, right? But the organic manure systems are still more profitable than the, than the conventional system. Okay, so that shows organic manure system is the most profitable with or with, without organic price premiums. Organic legume system can be profit, profitable with the organic price premiums. And reduced tillage at the end of the day did not affect profitability. Because although reduced tillage reduced the costs, it also slightly lowered crop yields and the total revenues. So uh, at the end of the day, reduced tillage did not affect profitability. So it shouldn't be a barrier for can both conventional and organic farmers to adopt reduced tillage practices. And those are the crop yields and uh, crop uh, prof profitability, economic profitability. And all, we also look at the crop nutrient content. Again, here are some data from long-term average of 2008 to 2020. We found that organic systems, the grains, the corns, produced in the different systems, they defer their uh, corn protein content. The grains, corn grains produced in an, in an organic legume and organic manure system showed higher content prote of protein than a conventional system. Now, you may argue that, well, you, we have different varieties of corn seeds in these different systems. That's right. In a conventional system, we have gen genetic, genetically modified seeds. And in organic system, we have 
corn uh, or organic certified seeds. So we're we might be comparing apples to orange. That's right. But we always buy seeds according to what are available on the market, what conventional or organic farmers would buy. So the comparison comparison would still be reasonable to look at the average nutrient content of the different systems. Oh, we also look at uh, the corn yield and nutrient content in the year of 2020, because we have different rotation system in these different systems. So corn might not be present in, uh, in all these systems every year, but in 2020, we had an opportunity that corn was present in, in each of these systems, providing the opportunity to, to look at the nutrient quality more closely in one year side by side. So in 2020, we found that, again, the organic system, especially the organic manure system, can match corn yield. And when you look at uh, things like crude protein or total folate, folate acid, which is vitamin B9, and vitamin B6, you can see that the organic systems, including the organic legume system and the organic manure system, continue to show that higher content of these nutrients than the conventional system. So that's the same year, side-by-side -side comparison. Then let's take a look at some of the soil health data. So we continue to, to, to find that the organic system, especially the organic manure system, had higher soil health, soil biological activities, for example, active carbon, that indicates the bioavailable, biologically available carbon that can, um, that can meet the carbon demand of the soil microbes and soil protein, which is, can be an indicator of organic source of nitrogen in the soil or higher, highest in the organic manure system. And microbial biomass. We know microbes are very important. They perform all the function in the soil and they are especially important for an organic system to making nutrients available for carbon sequestration. So we found that or microbial biomass mass carbon was highest in or higher in organic system than the conventional system. And even the organic manure system had higher microbial biomass carbon than the conventional system. And again, this is the average of three depths, zero to 10, 10 to 20, and 20 to 30. If we look closely of each of these depths, we can find something more interesting. For example, here, this is the microbial biomass data of the same data set, but broken down into each of the depths. So at zero to 10, we can see that the organic manure system still had highest microbial biomass carbon, but the difference between the conventional and the organic systems were small, were small, right? That's at the soil surface. But if you go down to 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 centimeter depths, you can see that the difference between the conventional and the organic systems are magnified, much larger than, the so, than zero to 10. So that shows the fundamental differences between the soil resources in conventional and organic systems. In the conventional system, the resources or the microbial abundance are concentrated in the top 10 centimeter depths. While in the organic systems, when you go down to 10 to 20, and 20 to 30, there are still decent amount of microbial abundance and a resource available for roots to go down to access to the nutrients. And so these are the biological soil health data. Overall, we found organic systems have higher microbial uh, abundance than conventional and the difference or larger at deeper soil depth. So soil health is not just about soil biology. It's also about soil, um, soil physics, soil structure, and other factors, right? So we also looked at compaction. So that's how compacted the soil is in each of these systems. So that's measured by 
pushing a probe into the soil and see how deep the probe can go to under at 300 PSI. So at a certain pressure. So at a certain pressure at 300 PSI, we found that the organic systems can, the inorganic systems, the probe or the penetrometer can go much deeper than the conventional system. So you can see that in organic system, the penetrometer can go as deep as 30 centimeters uh, deep uh, at 300 PSI. While in the conventional system, the organic, the, the penetrometer can go to about 20 centimeter depths. That shows the soils in the conventional system was more compacted than the organic system, right? However, these are the data under full tillage, under full tillage, before no-till was implemented or reduced tillage was implemented. So when we re implement the reduced tillage into all these systems, let's see what will happen. So we can see that with reduced tillage, the conventional system or conventional reduced tillage is even more compacted, even more compacted the penetrometer can go to could go down to less than 20 centimeter deep. It's about 15 centimeter deep, right? But in organic systems, organic systems, even with reduced tillage, the soil is not necessarily more compact, more compacted. It's roughly the same with full tillage. So that show actually shows a, a serious issue with the conventional no-till system, continuous no-till system. That is when you don't have any soil sort of disturbance uh, in the soil for over 12 years. That's what you might see, more severe soil compaction. So these, I think, worth attention of the conventional farmers. So they, they may need to uh, adopt some other co-adapting soil uh, building practices. For example, more diversification, more root, root activities to help to elevate that soil compaction. And water infiltration. So that's measured by a uh, uh, water infil infiltrometer. It measures how fast water can go, go into the soil profile. If the water can go quickly go through the soil profile, so there's less likely uh, for runoff and erosion to be happening, right? So we want faster water infiltration rates in the soils. So we found that across the board, the organic systems have higher, faster water infiltration than the conventional system. And with reduced tillage, reduced tillage reduced or slowed the infiltration in both conventional and organic systems, right? But even with reduced tillage, and the organic system still had higher or faster infiltrations than the conventional system. That shows the, the, the stru structural differences between the conventional and organic systems. And we combine all these soil health data and came up with the CASH, Cornell Comprehensive Assessment Soil Health Score of the, each of these systems. Overall, we found that the soil health was highest in the organic manure system. And there's no difference, no difference between the conventional and the, the organic legume system. So I guess with all these data we have collected rigorously in the last 12 years, we can we have some lessons for both the conventional and organic farmers to learn to, to make their system better, right? because agriculture is always evolving, right? We will not be this, at the same place in 10 years time as we are here today. So with the, uh, for the conventional system or the conventional no-till, we have um, observed the more compaction, more compaction under conventional no-till. So that can affect uh, the soil structure, the, por the porosity of soil structure and the infiltration rates, how fast the water can go through the profile. And we, apart from that, we also see some of these things happening in our conventional no-till plots. These are the herbicide-resistant weeds 
that we are seeing in the no-till corn and soybean plots. So for example, on, uh, in the picture on the right-hand side, it was me holding a, a, a small mulberry tree, a mulberry tree in a soybean field. That was the year of 2020, the beginning of the pandemic. So that small mulberry tree stopped our combine harvester from harvesting our, our, so, our soybean, conventional soybean. So these are not uncommon in conventional no-till system. Sometimes when I host some farmer friends from all around the Northeast who are very familiar with these, they would, they would tell me that they call them no-till trees. So it's just the nature of you know, what will happen in the Northeast. Because in the Northeast with this temperature and precipitation, some of these native species that have evolved, co-evolved with the soil, with the climate here, when there's no soil disturbance, these species, native species, they just want to take their land back. So there has to be uh, measures to deal with that in the conventional no-till systems. And in the organic system, the question we need to ask is how to make the system better. How, we know it works, right? We know it works and we know why it works. So the question is how to make it work better, right? As I mentioned, our organic no-till or organic reduced till system is not completely continuous no-till. It's rotational no-till. I think the future would be, we need to try to refine and improve the organic no-till towards continuous organic no-till. So there are some tools already available. For example, the weed zapper, the weed zapper that can deal with the weeds above the soybean above the soybean plants. And also the weed puller, that, that's also a tool that can pull the weeds out from the soybean rows. These hopefully can help the soybean uh, from uh, being affected by the weed pressure, which is uh, uh, a significant challenge for us in the recent years. So we need to develop and refine these technologies, including new other new technologies, for example, robotic weeding and remote sensing, all these tools or technologies would be welcome in the organic system to offer more chemical-free weed control options, right? So with that, I think the summary from this research update would be after 40 years, the farming system trial continues to, to demonstrate that ecologically-based organic agriculture can bring substantial agronomic, environmental, and economic benefits to our society. We have shown that by 40 years of data, right? And the fertility of organic systems should be managed holistically to achieve the best outcomes in soil health, productivity, and profitability, right? Organic systems are not created equal. Organic systems can be managed very differently in different parts of the world, even at the same place, right? So the fertility is really um, a, a key issue that how we need to manage. So not just to, to maintain the best pro pro productivity, but also to minimize the environmental uh, footprint. For example, some farmers, they would apply compost or manure every year, every year. So that might give them very good outcomes of, you know, in terms of productivity, but they may see very high uh, phosphorus levels, which can, uh, can put an, a, a threat to our local water, waterways, water quality. So how can we manage that? It has to be managed in, in a holistic way. Fertility input needs to be uh, managed with other practices to deliver the best outcome. Also, additional chemical-free weed control methods should be developed to refine our current organic systems to achieve continuous, continuous organic no-till. I think that's the, the, that's the future direction. I'm looking forward to seeing some new technology to help us get there in the next 10 years. So hopefully in the 50 years research update of the farming system trial, we can provide some very interesting and exciting uh, result. Okay, 
Before I wrap up, I would like to thank all my uh, uh, colleagues, collaborators for all your hard work that have contributed to the success of the project. And also I would like to thank our funding agencies, including USDA, Sarah William Penn Foundation, Tourist Sustainability Foundation, Blo uh, Blooming Prairie Foundation for your kind support so we can, uh, can continue and maintain this very important trial. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And now I'm gonna open up for questions. Okay, let's take a look at the q &A. So there's a question um, in the 2012 to 2020 data, why are the conventional land prices higher than organic? Okay, let's go back to that. I don't think the conventional land prices are higher than organic. It must be the same. Okay, here we go. So th these are the land costs of these each of these different systems. You can see that it's the same between the conventional and organic system. Again, this is a modern approach for a 110 acre farm. So that's uh, typical of the farms, uh, average, average farm size in the United States. So, there's a question about how much organic manure per hectare, organic manure per hectare. So we apply organic manure or composted organic man manure. Uh, just we, we do composting just to get rid of the pathogens. So we apply manure, not every year. Uh, we apply every three or every six years. So that means in 10 years time, there would be about two manure applications in our organic manure system. And every time it's about 18 tons per acre, 18 tons per acre. Acre, uh, acre is less than uh, 0.5 of a hectare, right? So I would think 18 tons per acre would be something like um, 40, 40, 40 tons per hectare. And okay. Okay, so oh, so a comment mentioned that the higher land price of conventional than organic was the, the next slide that had list all the costs. So these are the numbers, these numbers here are not for the land. These numbers, 79K, 75K, these are the total cost, including the land, field operations, and, and labor, and some other things, pesticide, herbicide, fertilizers. So you can see that still the land price would be the same for organic and conventional. But I would, I would think they have different values, to be honest, because you know after many years of organic and conventional management, I would think that organic land would, uh, would worth more, would be you know, of higher price. If I, was a, a, if I were a buyer, I would certainly buy a land that had been managed by organic because you, know, you see the differences. If you go close, if you go close to the fields, in organic fields, there are lots of different you know, uh, bugs, you know, and the wildlife, animals, biodiversity. In the conventional fields, most likely if you go there, you will encounter a smell of herbicides spray. So I think the value should be different from that, that perspective. Okay, so there's a question about the cash comparison. Okay, let's go. Oops. 
it, it's here. So the here's the cash, the comprehensive assessment of soil health by the Cornell um, Cornell Labs. So the cash is a way to to quantify soil health, taking into account of many different soil properties, including the soil physical, chemical, biological properties. So what we found is that the organic manure system had the highest soil health score under uh, this rating system. And there's no significant difference between the conventional organic legume system. So we found that uh, interesting. Maybe it's because, you know, the organic legume system, as I mentioned, after 40 years of management, the soil fertility or soil organic matter level and soil, uh, for example, those lay bio carbon nitrogen or kind of getting close to be depleted or not depleted, they are, they are being recycled very fast. So you don't see that build up in the organic leg legume system, organic matter the labor of soil resources are just being recycled and reused by the crop production in that system very efficiently, very fast. So you don't see that build up, but this system is still producing corn and soybean and, 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 and oats and wheat every year. So from that perspective, soil health score, although is similar between uh, the organic legume system and the conventional system. It may not reflect what this system, the mechanism is about, especially the processing rates, the processing rates of the, so the soils be uh, uh, between these two different systems. As we, we can see that then in a conventional system, the micro ac microbial activities were low, lower than the, than the organic legume system. So, so even they have similar scores under the Cornell cash rating, but what's happening in there, the mechanistic processes are fundamentally different. Okay, so here's a, an interesting question from Jesse who said that I live in a big city and want to know what I can do to support this movement. What advice do you have for someone like me? What can consumers do to encourage and support organic no-till agriculture? Thank you, Jesse, for the very kind question. I really appreciate that. I think there are a lot of things we can do. First of all, we can, we can help organic farmers or regenerative organic farmers by buying more organic, healthy organic food for our family, right? That's good for our family too. For example, I try to, not every time, but I try to buy organic milk for my own kids. You know, when, I, when there is a choice, I would buy, sign up uh, to a CSA to get weekly fresh, organic fresh produce, produce every week in the summer. So that's what we can do to incentivize the organic farmers to help take care of the land. And the other things we can do is try to, you know, to deliver the message, deliver a message to, to let more people know the importance and what's happening. What are, what are the issues with our current agriculture and the food systems, right? There are issues there, but without very big pressure, these, you know, it's just very difficult to change because farmers were told in the 1970s by the government to get big or get out, right? So if legislation and all the incentive, incentives, subsidies are not gonna change, it's very hard to farmers uh, to make change because farmers, they need to make a living first. They need to stay in the business to support their family, right? And I know many farmers, they, they understand what's happening in there. They know the difference between organic and conventional. And some of them even have tried organic, but it's just very difficult for them to be incentivized under our current systems. For example, large corn and soybean 
producers, they get subsidies, even they don't, you know, produce, uh, uh, even they don't, you know, take care of the land. So I think we need to deliver the message to, you know, our representative legislators to help make the change happen from top to bottom. So there's a question, uh, organic farming better and can, or they, or, organic farming can decrease CO2, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, is that true? I think, yes, the, the, I think the general answer would be yes. Organic farms have a larger potential in sequestering carbon and then their conventional under, uh, counterparts. But sometimes it's still case by case. It's depending on you, how you manage your organic farming or your conventional farming. So there are different ways to do organic. So it's very hard to standardize or average them. But in general, our cropping soils in the world have lost about uh, 30 to 50% of carbon in the last 50 to 100 years, 150 years. So that means there's a gap that can be filled in our cropping soils of carbon sequestration. So there, there's a, a gap that there's a um, potential for soil to store more carbon, store more carbon. So how can we do that? And recent scientific breakthroughs have shown that uh, organic car soil carbon storage or soil carbon sequestration can be accelerated by, by microbes. It's mostly by the microbial activities. Microbes, they decompose and utilize the carbon input into the soil as plant residues or organic input, manure or other sources. And then they process them and the microbial residues or microbial byproducts, they can form associations with soil minerals, silt and clay. And in such process, soil carbon can be um, made more stable. And this is a way that organic far farming can help achieve right? because organic farming is about trying to stimulate soil microbes, right? Help microbes do their job to try to efficiently recycle carbon nutrient cycling and microbial biomass and microbial residues in the meantime, a part of that can be stabilized uh, in association with minerals. So the conventional system, sometimes they don't have those components. Although in conventional system, you can try to put in uh, manure or you try to grow cover crops to help the microbes but it's still not very common in conventional system, which are still mostly about, you know, monocropping, monocropping and very simplified, you know, simplified systems. So I think in general, organic systems can help build carbon in the soil, but how much can we build soil carbon in the system? It's still case by case. Was manure or cattle? Um, yes, in our system, we uh, uh, we have the our manure was mostly from uh, uh, cattle, dairy cattle, uh, dairy cows. But as I mentioned, we usually compost manure before we apply them to the fields. The composting process can help get rid of help us get rid of the 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 pathogens, right? And also by adding some other or, uh, organic resources, for example, the leaf, leaves or the yard wastes, we can create a larger, quantity, a larger quantity of the manure of the compost. But there are other manures that can be used in farming as well. It's just a principle, right? In other parts, if you have large quantity of mushroom manure, uh, compost or, or chicken poultry manure, that's also, uh, can be beneficial. So the best way to use that, then again, it's case by case. You have to do some studies for your, for your actual operations.
Rick asked any idea why conventional no-till has higher compaction? Okay, that's a good question. So let's go back to this slide. Why does conventional no-till has more compaction? So farmers, if you're a farmer, you would know that very easily because that's what's happening. If you don't till the soil, no disturbance, then the soil is gonna be more compacted over time. When you till the soil, sometimes you are kind of creating some poor structures manually in the short term, in the short term. In a conventional system, it's uh, the no-till caused more compaction. We thought that would might be because, you know, the conventional system, as I mentioned, it's very simplistic. It's only in corn and soybean. And the corn and soybean in the conventional systems, they receive synthetic inputs. So they don't grow very strong roots because they don't need to, right? They get easy money, you know, just like a child being spoiled. They don't need to work hard. They get easy money. They get, you know, nutrients from synthetic fertilizer. They don't need to grow very strong roots. They don't need to establish links with soil microbes to create more structure in the soil. So there's, there's much less biological activities and root activities in the conventional O2 system. And there are just two crops in the system, corn sweeping. So the root architecture, the root channels are very, very simplified. So that's not very helpful for creating pore structures and you know, to ease the compaction in the soil. While in the organic system, it's different. We have four crops, four cash crops in the organic legume system, right? And we also have uh, four, maybe three or four uh, cover crop in the system. So there are many different root structure, architecture in the soil that can help create pore spaces. In the organic manure system, we have even more diversity species of the cash and cover crops. Those cash and cover crops, even in a rotational no-till setting, they can help, they can help combat the compaction issue. They can make soil loosen, loosen. And with the biodiversity, for example, earthworms, they can perform things like biological tillage, right? So that's why you see more earthworm in organic systems, organic fields not much in the conventional systems. So I think that's the reason why the conventional no-till has higher compaction uh, degrees. I think that's not uncommon in our farming systems. Okay, we have several questions in the chat as well. Let's take a look. Or is, or is the manure plot, okay, uh, as I mentioned, we, yeah, we have used the dairy uh, cow manure here but other manures can be used too. Okay. Okay, any other question? All right, I don't think we have any more questions. Again, I wanna thank you for your attention and please stay in touch. And uh, I hope you, um, I wish you a very nice day today. And please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Bye.